good afternoon or good morning or good night. I don't know wherever you are. Hello, my name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show. And it is a pleasure to have you all join us today. It's going to be a really great show. It's going to be memorable. It's going to be fun. It's going to be heartwarming. It's going to be all the things a good story and a good show should be about. But before we get started, and before I introduce my guest to you, I want to say hello to Amnon, who's very busy. I don't even know if he can say hello to me. I, I, I can't, I can't okay, he can't say hello. He's got a lot of things going on, but that's okay. So let me just remind everyone that during the show, you're more than welcome to call in anytime you like. If you're by a phone, you can call in at 919-518-9773, or you can Skype in with us on voice. That's at computers, that's plural, number 2K voice. And you can join the show anytime. And then also we have a chat, a live chat going on. So please feel free to put your name in on the little line. It says nickname, whatever name you want to choose. And you can ask questions. You can, you know, just talk to everybody else that's in there. It's fun and we love having you. So today's show is, is it's an amazing story. And let me tell you what, I've heard all kinds of stories. And I have been listening and promoting stories for years. And this one is going to be one of those that I will never forget. So my guest today is the author of North of Normal. Her name is Thea Sunrise Person. So let's welcome her to our show today, to our Breaking Free stage. Here's her book. Here you go. And let's welcome Sia. How you doing, Sia? Oh. Hello? Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm, I'm great. Thank you, Marilyn. How are you? I'm great. So nice to have you here. Thank you. And we have a lineup of people who are waiting to talk to her, too. So before we, we welcome all of them, I want Sia to um, just, she's got a great story. And so I'm going to ask her just to kind of re relay it to us, and then we're going to get into it much, much deeper. So Sia, you were brought up with a counterculture family, with a mom who was a teenager. So bring us into your story. Okay. Um, well, my family is from California, and um, in the 60s, they decided that um, they wanted to live off the grid. My grandfather was um, a real idealistic sort of man who had a dream of kind of escaping society altogether and going to live somewhere where there were no rules and no government and really no one to answer to but our own family. Um, and, uh, you know, the communes were one thing, but he really just wanted to to have, you know, us, our family, and um, to go to a very remote location. So uh, my mother happened to be pregnant with me at the time. She got pregnant when she was 16, and my father was not in the picture. Um, and so uh, my grandfather said, well, we're moving to Canada. So off we go, and we move into the wilderness, and that's where I lived um, off and on for the first 10 years of my life. Um, uh, my mother, you know, became involved with boyfriends from time to time, so we would sort of go off and, you know, have crazy adventures with them and then end up back in the wilderness again. Uh, and the whole time I was kind of like, wow, my, my family is pretty crazy, and I had a, a real, really deep-seated craving for a more normal life, even though... I didn't have much to compare it to because the wilderness was kind of, you know, all I knew. Um, so when I finally moved to the city, which was uh, at age nine, I decided I wanted to be a model. So at the age of 13, I um, took off and became a model, went to New York and Paris. And um, yeah, that's that's most of the story. <laughs> well, let's go. Let me let's go back a little. Well, first of all, I got to ask you just now. So when you took off to be a model, did you take off by yourself? Yes, I did. All by yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, my mother wasn't exactly, a, you know, she was a very, very free spirit. And uh, she thought, you know, if I'm happy, if I'm doing what I want, then she's happy too. You know, she trusted me. She never worried about me. She was very, you know, she thought I could take care of myself. And, um, and for the most part, I did. I went off into the big world when I was 14. Um, but I always returned because I kept up my schooling. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was quite ready to leave my mother and her, her crazy ways behind by then. So you, so you growing, so you grew up in the, in the wilderness in yes. teepees, right? Is that what I read? That's right. Canvas teepees. And how old were your grandparents at the time? My grandparents were in their mid forties. Actually, I, I think I calculated, um, that my, 
my grandmother would have been the exact same age that I am right now when they uh, decided to move into the wilderness. How fascinating. And so every day was a different adventure. Oh, gosh, yeah. You, that's, that's an understatement. I mean, you know, living in the wilderness um, with really no connection to the outside uh, other than some summer visitors who would come and, you know, stay with us for a, a little while in the summer, and then they'd take off when it got too cold because it was very cold. I mean, we're, we're talking about living under canvas um, in minus 50 degrees Celsius weather. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about bears and cougars and, um, you know, I fell through the ice. I almost drowned. Uh, I, I had many, many close calls and, um, it, things got even crazier when my, my mother decided that we were going to take off and live with one of her boyfriends, Carl. And we ended up on a crazy crime, crime spree, stealing from cabins, living in abandoned cat, uh, cottages and um, just, you know, lots of craziness, trucks catching on fire, cops chasing after us, you know, growing pot, escaping, him getting arrested, my mom and I living in, you know, basically in a, a, a nylon tent in the middle of the wilderness for a few months with no supplies. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. And you're a mom. I'm a mom. I have three young children. And so how... So, I mean, there's so much to talk about as far. I, I think we're going to jump around a lot. That's and fine. So, yeah. So there's so much to talk about. So as a mom now, how are you as a mom now? And how did you know to, how did you know how to even be a mom? Well, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. And it's a question I get a lot. And, you know, I think that for most people, me included, mothering, parenting is just a very instinctual thing. And I, I've, I've never really questioned my, um, my ability to parent. Uh, however, I, you know, I'm aware that people who come from a background like mine, where there are a lot of challenges, tend to either um, repeat their, their parents' mistakes or go the extreme opposite. So I really do try to kind of, you know, walk the line and stay, you know, right in the middle, not being extreme either way. Um, but, you know, certain things like I really do try and encourage self-sufficiency in my children. Um, you know, I, I'm very, you know, affectionate and very protective of them, of course, but I also want them to find their own way and get out into the big world and not be too coddled. And that's, that's not real life. I want them to be prepared for real life. Is there anything that scares you? Oh gosh, of course. I mean, something happening to my children or my family or my friends that, that really scares me. Um, but uh, no, not not too many other things. <laughs> spiders. <laughs> spiders. Oh my God, spiders! I mean, you must have seen a lot of spiders when you were uh, in the wilderness. That's for sure. Yes, but luckily Canada, you know, we don't really have poisonous spiders, so um, not much to worry about. But man, do they freak me out! <laughs> oh my gosh, I bet. So day to day, like, give us a typical day for you as a child. You know, what did you do? Well, um, there were a lot of chores. I mean, you know, if you're living in the wilderness, you are dependent on no one but yourself for your survival. And so the day would start, I would get up and my mom, you know, she wasn't much of a parent. She, she really, she was, her own needs came first. And so from a very young age, I sort of started looking after her. And I remember we would get up in the morning and it would be really cold in the teepee. And the first thing she would say is, um, can you go and warm up the footstone for me? Uh, we used to have this, these big rocks that we wrapped in, um, in flannel. And we'd heat up the rock in the wood stove, pull it out, wrap it in the flannel, and then we'd put it down by our feet um, to warm our feet up because it was so cold. So I would get up out of bed and I'd warm up the footstone. And then I'd um, run outside into the meadows and just you know, run free. I had my stick horses. I didn't have uh, really many toys. I had a doll and a book and uh, everything else was stick horses and rocks and forts that I would build out of branches. And uh, that's what I did all day. I played and I helped a lot with um, chores around the, uh, around the camp. I would haul water from the river. Um, we had a yoke and just balance the two buckets and carry it into camp. I'd help my grandmother and my mother with the cooking and the cleaning. Um, we'd bathe basically once a week in a big tub, either outside in the summertime or in the teepee in the wintertime. And we would have to melt lots of snow to, to get the, the, the tub water. 
Uh, and lots of, you know, my grandfather hunted a lot for our food and, and gathered. So we would spend a lot of the time in the summertime gathering mushrooms and berries. And I would go hunting with my grandfather for grouse and date, um, uh, caribou and bear and we'd go fishing and, um, yeah, that was just kind of my life. It was all about keeping things running around the camp. So what, if you look, when you look back, what was the thing that you loved the most? You know, I, I, I would just, I will never forget the, just the feeling of freedom I had running around in those meadows on my stick horses, um, really having not a care in the world. Um, and that, that was short-lived, unfortunately, because when I was five, my mother and I left the wilderness with her boyfriend, and things got a lot uglier after that. Uh, but those, the memories I have of just, you know, that, that freedom and knowing that I had my mother all to myself and my grandparents all to myself. And of course that all changed when, uh, my, cause my mother was, you know, always trying to find a boyfriend. Um, but those, those are my best memories. So you went to school and how, how, how old were you when you first started going to school? Um, I started going to school when I was six, um, and that was kindergarten. My mother had tried to get me into grade one, but the school wouldn't accept us because we didn't have a permanent address at the time. We were actually squatting in a cottage. Um, so she put me in kindergarten, and um, I went for about three months. And it was during that time that I really figured out that, wow, my life is not like the other kids. And I was not like the other kids. I was too tall. I came from the wilderness. I brought peanut butter and garlic sandwiches to school. Uh, my clothes looked like they were out of a trash bin. Uh, I didn't know how to ride a bike. I didn't know how to swim. Um, you know, all these sorts of things. And that's when I, I really started to have a craving for a more normal life. Um, so after those three months in kindergarten, um, we moved again, and we moved to uh, uh, one of the Gulf Islands here in British Columbia. So I was actually able to attend first and second grade at a, a normal school. So that was uh, that was good for me. So there's so many. I mean, there's so many things to talk to Carl to talk to see about. We have a friend of hers on the the line waiting, but I'm going to ask her in just a minute because there's still so many things I'm curious about. <laughs> so I. I know that I read that your there was nudity and there was pot. I mean, you grew up with that from an early age, and your clothes had, you know, potholes. Yeah, basically. Not well, they smelled pot. like pot smoke all the time. That's for sure. <laughs> and did you engage early in smoking pot? When they did they give you oh, pot? God, no, no, I was not interested at all. Um, I really, you know, I really wanted to be completely different from my family, from the very, very youngest of ages. Uh, but you know, it was, it was crazy. I mean, you know, when you have a mother who is in bed beside you having sex with a random guy and this goes on and on and on throughout, you know, your, your teens, like, you know, I couldn't get away from it. Um, pot was every day, all the time, 24 seven, it felt like, um, the smell of my childhood is marijuana. <laughs> Uh, it really is, you know. Um, and uh, there, were, there were no boundaries, no discipline, no guidance, no authority. It was just, you know, I was I was just able to to go off and figure things out for myself. And what I figured out was that I did not want to be like these people. Um, so I, it took me a very very long time to um, get interested in drugs or alcohol or anything like that. Uh, but I did eventually in my 20s, and um, I, I went off the rails for a little bit there quite badly. Um, but, you know, it was really my past catching up with me that I had not dealt with. You know, it's interesting because I think, I think you have such an amazing life to hang on a billboard because, you know, so we all tend to, you know, we, 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 we are born into something, maybe nothing like Sia. And maybe for some kids, certain things are worse or whatever, certain, whatever it is. And we jump around on that continuum until we find, hopefully, we jump around on that continuum, hopefully, till we find a place of comfort where we can call it, okay, I've, I'm, 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 I'm good here. This is a place that I can now, I can, I can live from. And I think that's yeah. what you did. And I, and I, but there's something inside of you or something outside of you that was always connected to something greater 
I believe that. I do. I mean, how else can you explain, you know, being three, four years old and looking at my family and going, wow, these people are really weird. <laughs> like, uh, wasn't I supposed to be born somewhere else into some other family? Um, but, you know, what you say about, uh, you know, finding your place, Marilyn, is so true. And, you know, I've done this, like looking for my my normal, which was here, just like trying to find it. And um, it, it, it's, it's quite ironic when you think about it, because my family was so obsessed with having their freedom that they forced their freedom onto me. And their definition of freedom was nothing like mine. So it took me, uh, it took me decades and decades to, uh, to find my own, what I consider to be my own freedom. And that happens to be the suburbs, you know, living in suburbia with my kids and my husband and my friends. And I drive a minivan and that's, that's my freedom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the show, of course, is called Breaking Free. Yes. So, you know, we, we, you know, most of the time I think of freedom, you know, breaking free from, you know, the societal expectations, yeah, right? Not from freedom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know. That's like a whole nother show for me. We'll have to talk yeah. about that later because really breaking free from from freedom. Yeah. You know, that's cool what that? I had to do. And that's why. And I would question myself so often going, what's wrong with me? You know, why is this not okay with me? Why does everyone else in my family love this lifestyle? And I can't stand it. I want out so bad. Mm -hmm. um, it took me a very long time to sort of figure out what my, you know, my gauge or for normal, for acceptable be behavior yes, really was. Yes, yes, because yes. My, my family always taught me that it was a certain thing that, that didn't feel right to me. Right. Well, th these are some really deep uh, conversations when you talk about what's normal. Yes, you know? absolutely. Of course. Well, everyone, I think, knows for them, you know, what is normal for them. And they have that little compass, that little gauge inside themselves that tells them when they're, you know, on the right track, off the right track of what their normal should be. And it also depends for person to person because some people don't want normal. You know, some people go out of their way to create drama in their lives or to just, you know, do something completely different from what everyone else is doing because that's their calling. And um, it was just different for me. My normal was was pretty normal. <laughs> I mean, by by everyone's standards, I believe. And I guess just like we said, you know, you you had to break free from freedom. Well, who's to say what normal again? Who's to say how we identify what normal is for your grandparents and your mother, you know, you can look at and go, excuse me, but for them, that was their normal for that, for that, for that lifetime. Yeah. And they looked at me when I was a teenager in my twenties and said, excuse me, yeah. what are you doing with your life? You know, that's crazy. Why would you want any of this? Who are you? Yeah, who are, you? <laughs> who are you? So I want to talk to you more, but we have a, a very good friend of Sia yes. on the line, and I just want to tell everyone who's listening that we're having a little problem with Skype, so we can only take one call in at a time. So I'd like Carly to come on and chat, and then I know um, we have other friends and maybe some relatives of Sia that are waiting for the opportunity to share, to talk about her. So hold on, and let's talk to Carly. Carly is an old, old friend of Sia's from when she first got into school. Is that right? Well, Carly and I, Carly's my oldest friend. We've been friends since fifth grade. And um, the only time in my life when I actually lived in a house for a, a long, extended period of time was when I was living in Calgary with my mother. Um, so from fifth grade until graduating high school, I, le I lived in the same house with my mother and uh, I started this new school, and I was horribly shy, horribly withdrawn, hor feeling like a freak, still feeling like the freak from the wilderness. And on the first day, um, the teacher asked Carly to show me around the school. And uh, we've just been, you know, the, the greatest friends ever since. We've been, she's seen me go through a lot. Wow. Carly. Hi, Marilyn. Oh, Carly, I'm, I'm about to, I'm, I'm seriously about to cry. <laughs> Honestly, to be blessed with such a friend. Well, I feel like I'm the one who's blessed. Well, no, us. I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, now with three of us are, and I'm not too, and everybody that's listening, you are all, you know what? You're at the right place at the right time. We're all being blessed. Yes. So 
Carly, talk to us. Tell us about Sia. Well, you know, Sia is one of the most remarkable people I've ever come across, met, uh, had the pleasure of spending time with, living life with. She's, she's just the most resilient person I know for sure. She sets very high standards for herself. She works very hard. I don't know anyone who works harder. She, she achieves everything that she sets out to do. So you, you, you became friends. How did you see her make a change from this, this, this you know, wilderness child who comes in who's scared, probably scared you know, of a lot of things and meets you? And then how, what kind of changes did you see her make? How did you see her make those changes? Well, you know, she was always a certain kind of person. I didn't see this little wild wilderness child flourish into, um, you know, the swan that she became. She always had that in her. I mean, we were we were both always kind of a little bit different, um, but you know, we we definitely had our our family obstacles. And I think we yeah, had a really had a difficult childhood too. She did, and, but, but very I very different. Yeah, different, but yeah, difficult, but different. But you know, when you come from, I mean, when we met, we didn't know anything about each other, and I was kind of like, oh, I got to show the new girl around. But you know, it took about five minutes for us to become best friends, even though we we had such different upbringings. And and so, Sia, is there anything you want to ask Carly or talk to Carly or ask her to share? You know, I, I just, um, Carly's just been such a rock for me over the years. And, um, you know, she's the one person who, well, not the one person, there have been others, but I've, you know, I've, I've just never felt any judgment from her. And I've gone through some very tough times. Um, there was a time when I, left my second husband and uh, long story it's in the book uh, but I I really didn't have a dime to my name and I had a small son and I didn't have a car to drive you know she stepped up her and her husband gave me their second car to drive they supported me and um, she's just one of the loyal most loyal friends I could hope for and I really do think that part her friendship helped me to accept myself and um, to feel like a more uh, a person who could actually integrate into society because she was sort of a popular girl and I was like if the popular girl likes me then maybe I'll be okay you know and so she really gave me confidence just by being my friend so C Carly yeah Carly, that's pretty yeah, nice I mean, stuff there yeah the, I mean it's it's really amazing because you know when you come from some kind of adversity you know, is there something, I mean, I know my childhood was, it was on some level, it was great, but then there was also lots of confusion, lots of pain, fear, you know. So when you look back and you think to yourself, and I, you know, I don't want to pry into your um, childhood, but what is it about having the kinds of, you know, challenges that you had or the kinds of challenges that Sia had? To, to make it? I mean, how do, what is it that it took to make it for you that you could share with someone who's, somebody who's listening? Well, you know, when you grow up with a background uh, of, of fear, uh, I, I think that people are just, I, I believe that you're born resilient. I mean, you do learn street smarts and some of these other survival techniques along the way. Um, but I think I was blessed enough to be born resilient. And then meeting Sia uh, and, and uh, we had each other as support. I mean, we, we were inseparable. We were always sleeping over at each other's places. We were together all day at school after school uh, so we we really we had each other and that made a huge huge difference like I don't know where I would be if I didn't have such a good close 
friend that I could trust and and completely rely on and just be myself around all the time. Yeah. And I just want to add here quickly too that, you know, I at the time when I was a well, later when I was a teenager and Carly and I were friends, my mother was such a huge embarrassment to me because, you know, my friends would come over and she'd be like, so you smoking pot yet? Or, you know, she'd be topless or she'd smoke pot in front of them, talk, ask, want to talk to them about sex, you know. And uh, so as a result, I just, you know, brought nobody over. I was just way too embarrassing. Um, and Carly was the one person that I let in. And it was really uh, helpful to me. And this sounds kind of bad, but I really needed someone to like, download about my mom with and just say oh can you believe how embarrassing and crazy she is you know and uh and Carly was able to like you know sympathize with me and so it helped a lot to just have someone that I could uh you know talk to about it right. well you know I read I mean I know for myself that I always think of in, in, with the work that I do and doing these shows and that I was set up to have had some crazy stuff happen when I was younger and to have some kind of resilience, some kind of gut, some kind of balls, call it whatever you wish, so that I could do this and I yeah. could be this and I could, yeah, you, right? You agree? You, you feel well, you're, fulfi way? You're, you're fulfilling your life's purpose, right? Which you, and you wouldn't have come to know that this was your life purpose, I think, if you hadn't gone through that. Yeah, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's very interesting because all the stuff that goes on, that somehow I wasn't killed, I, I wasn't murdered, I didn't kill myself, I didn't, I mean, I, I could wake up and find myself in some funky places, yeah. but only so that I had something that would Absolutely. Help, right? I feel the same way about my yeah. past, that I lived through it to be where I am now and kind of spread the word and help others. I believe that. Carly... I would love for you to stay on longer, but we our phones are, are, are burning up. There are people who want to call in, and, we, and for some reason only can take one at a time. So I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Carly. Well, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Yeah. Just listen. Keep listening. Oh, I will. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. So okay. I'm going to – Heather. 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 Is she on now? Okay. Heather, come on. You can. It's your turn. Oh, uh, Heather. Yay. Computers. 2K. Hello? Okay, she's she's there. Good. Heather? Um, oh, my gosh. Hello. Oh, you <laughs> made it. You made Can it, you hear Heather. me? Yes. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I, I will have to get off the computer. <laughs> yes. So Heather's calling you... all the way from Australia. Yeah. So, we'll, I think she's, uh, are you there now? Yes, I'm here. I'm just going to turn this down off the computer. Sorry. No, that's okay. And so I can tell us. Hear you. So tell us. Okay, who, here I am. I made it through. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So now, Heather, who are you? Yes. Who are you in Sia's life? Well, Sia and I, we got to share quite an incredible life in Munich, Germany. Um, we modeled together for many years over there. And, um, yeah, I was just. So very fortunate to have gotten on a booking with her at one stage, and we became very fast friends. I think it took about 30 seconds. <laughs> and, and so what was uh, Sia like back then? Uh, was so at, at what age was that, by the way? Look, we would have been probably, what, Sia, about 20, 21, 21 22? 21, yeah. yeah. And so what was she like then yeah, when you met her? Oh, gosh. Oh, she was just stunning as always, absolutely beautiful. And, you know, she always just had a smile on her face. You would have never, ever suspected or known. And, in fact, I never even knew. She never told me about her, her childhood. Every so now and then she would tell me a few little things, but I never really learned about it until she sent me a, <laughs> her manuscript, her first one, and um, I was just shocked, but because uh, I never knew she'd never divulged any of that. You would have never guessed. She was always happy, chirpy. She just looked like the perfect Barbie doll walking in, and everybody, you know, she just lit the room up because she was she had that had that beautiful smile and just that friendly friendly personality and bubbly and always, 
you know, never down, ever down. And so, you know, it's so interesting because I had this like flash when you said that she would light up a room and I kind of had a flash like, okay, she, you don't, you don't get a life like this for no reason. You get a life like this because you have, you've got to show the world something about how you, how you can, I mean, for all of you that are listening, regardless of where you're listening from or, or how you're listening or what your life is like, take a look at this. You know, here's a, a, a young woman, a young kid living the craziest life who ends up being a model for Pete's sakes and being able to walk into a, knowing she's pretty. First of all, how did you know you were pretty? Sorry, I'm just having some issues here. Um, you know, people always told me I was pretty growing up. Uh, my mom always told me I was pretty. That's one thing that she was always, you know, she 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 tried to build up my confidence. Uh, and I was tall and I was skinny, and um, I just I just had a feeling that um, modeling was something that I'd be able to do. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, Heather really was my gosh, like my first real, really close modeling friend. And, and her and I formed a, a bond that, you know, it, it was so strong that like, it, it's never, it's always been, it's, it's the same now, even though she lives in Australia and I'm in Canada, our bond is just as strong now as it was when we first met. And again, you know, uh, and it's interesting because I think I'm finding a, a common thread just now that I'm, uh, that I've discovered Heather was also a girl who was very popular and very well liked and had a ton of friends and um, so, you know, upbeat and also very adverse childhood. So I seem to be attracted to women like that. Um, but uh, she just had so much going for her and she was a bit of a wild child too. And that really, I was very attracted to that because it brought out a side of me that I had not dared let come out because I was so afraid of being like my mother. And um, she actually became, in a way, a, a healthy outlet for that because we would go out and party and stuff. But I know I always knew I was safe with her. But I, it was a side of myself that I really needed to express. And, um, <clears throat> and also, you know, she just, I felt so accepted by her. Uh, again, it was just, you know, her friendship was uh, very, very healing for me. Oh. So she was one of those special people along your path. Chosen, she was, she was chosen to be on your path. Marilyn, you know what? I can't, I can't hear you at all. You can't hear me at all? No. No, I can't hear her either. Huh. That's, it. okay. Uh, Amnon's working on it. So you can't hear me either. Still? Barely. It's like a whisper. Barely. Hello? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't know what, I don't know, but I'll try to talk louder so you can hear me. I can hear you now. Oh, that's much you better. Okay, good. Yeah. Whew, we're having some funny weather around, so who knows what's going on. But anyway, I think people <laughs> are along our path for, for different reasons when we are willing to I think, see, it was so, it seems to me you were so willing. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing anything. I don't know. Nothing? I'm not looking. Okay, that's, I just turned, I had to turn my volume up. I can hear okay. you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So willing. No, I can't hear anything. I can't, I'm sorry, I, I'm not hearing anything. It's, it's like okay. muted. All right. Hold on a second, everybody. Okay. Hello? Okay, that's better. Yeah. Okay. See ya. We're going to yes. try this again. It appears that you were so, um, it was so important for you to have a life that you, you seized every moment that you could seize and learn from whoever you could learn from and just took your T took your life. Yes. I mean, I certainly didn't think of it in those terms at the time. Um, you know, I just thought of it as finally, you know, be spreading whatever wings I had away from my family and trying to figure things out for myself. 
Uh, but, you know, I really was like a blind person stumbling through the dark looking for an object because I, I didn't have, I didn't know what I was doing. I had, I didn't have any guidance. I had no mentors. I had no role models. And so, you know, Carly and then Heather became real role models and mentors for me. Um, it was a little late in my life, um, but uh, I, yeah, looking back now, <clears throat> Certainly, I was, you know, just doing whatever I could to, to learn and figure things out for myself with the help of my friends. Mm. Heather, can you hear well, me? Well, I was going to say yeah. that she's, you know, now knowing obviously her, her story, her background, thinking about survival. You know, for me, it's when I think about our time in, in Germany, we were all flying blind then. We were, you know, we had no direction, no adult supervision. We were, you know, I came from basically a farm in Texas. You know, I had no guidance. No, no one in my family was doing anything like that. So we were all kind of in the same boat. But for Sia, you know, coming from that survival kind of background, I, I think sometimes we... Well, it's an instinctual thing, and you learn it. It's different than street smarts, but it's that it's along that ilk, you know. And we were all just searching to try and find some normality in this this new world of of fashion and modeling. It was so very, very different, I think, for many of us to be thrown in or thrust into that environment and just go, okay. <laughs> But and you just you know to find a friend like Sia, it was just such a godsend or a gift you know because wow you found someone that you were both on that same boat you know trying to paddle and and find your way through you know right. Well, I really appreciate your saying so, especially the street, the street smart thing because sometimes you don't grow up on the street, you know sometimes yeah. it's the reverse and you know I never thought about that either before because. I've put myself into situations that I've said, I can do this because I'm street. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm wilderness. You're wilderness, right? And Heather's you're farm. <laughs> yeah, and Heather, you're farm. <laughs> you know, I'm farm. You're farm. <laughs> and, and in Give the me end, a cow. I can sort the milk. <laughs> yeah, but in the end, so, t so Heather, in the end, what, what does it take to make it? I, you know, for me... <laughs> I think it's like what you both were saying before. There's something inside us, all of us, that we're we're here for a purpose. We're here for a reason, and we don't get born in with a, a book that shows us the map or the plan of what that is. We've got to trust that instinct, that that drive that's within us, and and keep trusting and believing somehow through all of it in ourselves, because that's where that's where the answers are. And if you can connect with that early on, and, and I think survival forces you to do that, you learn such a unique, special gift mm -hmm. that can carry you through any diversity in life, and yeah. there can yeah. be many, as we yeah. know. Perseverance, that's what it's all about, really. So, uh, can you go, I want you to go into a little more detail about what you mean by perseverance, because this is for anybody, I mean, you're listening to some extreme, something very extreme, right? So oh, person, yeah. oh yeah. So Heather, I'm, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm gonna there uh, there. I think there's um, some other people who want to call in, and we're having some technical issues. So I want to make sure everybody gets Absolutely. a chance. So you are an angel. Absolutely. Thank you so much for <laughs> being here with us. Thanks, sweetie. Love Absolute you. Pleasure. Love you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Continue Bye. to listen. Um, so again, if anybody else wants to call in on computers, that's plural. Two K voice. Please feel free. Okay, so now let's talk about perseverance. Okay, uh, perseverance is really what has gotten me through everything. Um, those moments where you feel like you want to give up, totally normal, totally fine, just don't do it. <laughs> you know, that's what I learned. I mean, I persevered for decades to get this life. Um, when I wrote my book, it took me six years to write it. It was rejected by every publisher in, in you know, in the world, basically. Uh, but I, I persevered. I rewrote it again and again and again. It's now a bestseller here in Canada, and it's doing well in the States, too. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I just, I can't overstate 
enough how important it is to just not give up on what you know you want and and what you believe is you know what will fulfill you um and sometimes it can be so frustrating and so disheartening when it feels so far away um i remember you know one of my darkest times was when i i split up with my second husband and i was in my you know late 30s and i'm like oh my god really like i went through that really really traumatic difficult childhood i fought tooth and nail to become a model and to do well at it i had some things that really weren't working for me i i've had my teeth fixed but um at the time i you know my my obviously i didn't have braces when i was a child my teeth were crooked um, and I was told, you know, your teeth are going to be a big problem as a model. And they were, but I found ways around it and I still, you know, was able to do it. So I fought very hard to be a model, to be successful. Um, I ended up doing very well at it. Uh, and so I was like, you know, did I really go through all of this and try so hard just to be now in my late thirties and it's all falling apart again. And, you know, what am I supposed to do? But I, again, I just, I, I persevered and I thought, no, I, I have, I, I have a life that I want and I'm going to get it and I'm not going to stop until I do. And I didn't. And I, and I've done it. Well, so you, anyone, anyone can do it really. If you just, you know, you just got to stick with it. You know, it's amazing. Cause I, maybe I needed to hear you say that today. Cause I am, I'm a, I mean, I'm a go getter. I uh -huh. mean, I, I managed to have things, you know, work out some way, somehow, some shape or form. I find myself in places like with people with multiple degrees and I'm there and I'm really good, you know, awesome. really, you know, the same, but you know, it's not, to have a, a benchmark. Sia is going to become my new benchmark. Oh, you're so sweet. And, and, and that says a lot. Thank you. Because <laughs> you are quite the benchmark. So for, you know, for anybody that's tuning in and has just tuned in, Sia has an incredible story. She has an incredible book that I highly recommend people go out and read so she can shed a lot of light on your life. But she had a crazy childhood brought up with, you know, grandparents and a teenage mom, pot, nudity, in the wilderness, crazy, crazy life, you know, didn't have anything, was in a bed with her mother while her mother was having sex. Oh, my God. Can you just imagine? The worst of things. And... But but look at her. She's in a beautiful home, in a beautiful kitchen. She has three children. She has a husband. She has a career. She's written a book. She's written. A, she's writing a second book. Um, I mean, heck. I'm living my dream. I yeah. am. I really am. Like, voila. It ain't magic. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, we have somebody else on the phone. Hello. Hello. And who, my I ask, are we speaking to? This is Shannon. She is very, very good friend. Shannon. Shannon. Mary. Yay. Hey, Shannon. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi. So where are I you? I mistakenly yeah. thought it was between one and two, so I'm just tuning in now. <laughs> That's okay. You you made it. So, good. So tell us about you. Where are you in the friendship line here? I um, She and I went to high school together, but I was two grades ahead of her, and so... Um, didn't uh, didn't know her very well, but had heard about her because she's this big international model, and there weren't too many of those in my high school. In fact, she was the only one. <laughs> and um, so I, you know, I had to check her out and see who this big supermodel was. So that's when I first knew she existed, and then um, we were reunited again. Oh, almost, gosh, what would you say, Tia? Like eight years ago, ten Something years like ago, seven, yeah seven, eight years ago, yeah, and um, we were in a park, and I thought I'd tell that story, but only if you want me to. Sure. <laughs> okay. It's a great story. So, so, yeah, so Sia, you know, we never hung out or anything in high school, but like I said, I knew who she was, and, um, and I did think she was very pretty, but she seemed very quiet, and I thought she was either aloof and perhaps snobbish because of her fancy career, or maybe just really shy, so I couldn't, I couldn't tell. And then um, years and years later, I'm in a park with my new baby and my other son, who's a couple years older, and I see this beautiful blonde woman is looking at me. And I'm, I kept wondering, I'm like, is she looking at me? Is she looking at my kids? Do I know her? 
does she think I'm hot? I don't know. <laughs> and, of course, I was very flattered because she's really, really a knockout, as you can see. And, um, and, and then all of a sudden she walks up to me. And I'm like, Ooh, what's going on here? And she goes, are you Shannon Nearing? And I'm like, yes, I am. How do you know? How do you know? And she's like, we went to high school together. I'm Sia. And I'm like, oh, my God, I totally remember you. And, and anyway, we started gabbing. And within about five minutes, we figured out that we were both writing books at the time. And she told me the name of hers. And I instantly knew that, 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 that she had it, that she had a story, that she had a book, that she had a success on her hands. Because just the little bit I, I understood and had gleaned um, and the title of the book, North of Normal, which she had way back when, I just knew we're winners. So that's when that's when we got to know each other, and we were instant besties and hung out all the time. That's that's wonderful. It's amazing how things happen, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And, and you know, Shannon, I remember I'll never forget her words. She wrote my she read my manuscript. Um, we'd only been hanging out for a couple of months, and she said, "This is going to be so big." you know, you, you, you've got an incredible story and everyone's going to want to talk about it. And I was like, yeah, I doubt it, you know, but those, those words stuck with me in particular for years and years and years as I struggled to write that book and get it published. Um, and so she's always been, she was so encouraging, um, of my creative endeavors and, oh, uh, also, I was and right again, behind you. <laughs> and again, um, you know, uh, just thinking about this whole whole theme we have going of my friends, Shannon was another girl who, you know, in high school, she was so popular and everyone wanted to be her friend. And she had these big parties at her house on the weekend. Of course, I was never invited because I was only in grade 10. Um, but, you know, and we, she really didn't know me. But I used to look at her in the hallways and think, oh, Shannon Nearing, she's so popular and cool. You know, it's like I could never be friends with someone like that. So when I ran into her in the park that day, I was... I was still quite, quite insecure, you know, and I, for me to go up to the most popular girl in school and say, you know, want to be my friend? Can we hang out? Was like a really big deal for me. And her, so again, her acceptance has, has been a very healing friendship for me. Again, I'm very, very blessed. Oh, I'm so, I'm so happy to be there for you. And, and I wasn't that popular, Marilyn, just so you know. <laughs> Maybe in Sia's mind, you know how Maybe. things get bigger. Maybe. But um but no, it's been it's been such a unique friendship because Sia and I almost think alike. Um we really do. We have the same opinion on so many matters. It's it's really fun and I think that people can't be the most interesting people in my life are the ones who've gone through a lot of crap. And yeah. Sia's gone through more crap than anyone I know. So that ranks her right up there with, like, she's, she's the most interesting. She's also the most grounded and, um, and, you know, a really good ear for me. And that's why I try to be a good ear for her as well because I want to reciprocate that because once you've lived a life like Sia has, you know, the, the trivialities of life become, become silly. And, and that's where we completely agree Sia and I, we just, we don't have a lot of time for BS. Wouldn't you agree, Sia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We yeah. definitely have that in common. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of people who are living in, you know, yuck. And hearing this story, you know, is so hopeful to them. And also knowing that there are people along the way that are they, you know, Sia, you, oh, you didn't yeah. have any brothers or sisters, right? No. No. So you were oh, you were an only child, and and not yeah. just an only child, but probably in a lot of cases lonely. I would think. Were you lonely growing up? You know, you... I don't remember being lonely, okay. and that's a funny thing. I was so my own best friend. Uh -huh. You know, I was so used to being on my own that I had my book, I had my dolls, I had you know, and I was I was good. I was okay. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I just want to say really quickly, yeah. my husband's been trying to call okay. me. Let's, he's okay, let's okay. Having a tough time, but he okay. can just step in beside me. Oh too. yes, definitely. Okay, let's do oh, that. Yeah, love that. Yeah, come on, Remy. That's how you pronounce it, right, Remy? Come on, Remy. We've been looking for you. Down. Is We've Shannon been staying on you. the line? Yeah, yeah. Shannon. Yeah, do I get off or what do I do? Um, <laughs> well, I would say uh, it'd probably be good to get off unless okay. unless Sia has something else to that she wants. Is just that good? Love you, babe. Okay, just love in case. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon, love for you being too. here. You're so welcome. Bye. Bye.
Hi. Remy, welcome. Hello. So what's it like being married to Sia? Uh, pretty amazing, as you might imagine. Uh, tell us, I mean, because she's quite a woman. Yeah, she is. I mean, it's, uh, you, I think the biggest thing is never taking it for granted because uh, she does a lot of stuff. She's got this sort of perpetual drive to do stuff, and it's uh, pretty amazing. Um, and also, I mean, she works on so many fronts. Like, you know, the fact that she's, I mean, if she's not doing edits on a book or um, doing something else, she'll start a project, like, making things. And um, that's one of the things where Shannon comes in really well. She always has lots of projects to start see on. That was a... Early on, that was almost a problem because it needed to keep focused on her book. Uh -huh. But uh, but no, she's she's just a perpetual motion machine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing that's a little bit uh, deceptive for me is that I often forget how much energy and time it takes for her to deal with the kids. So, you know, because I'm not here during the day, I'm working most of the time. So um, that's one of those things where, like, every now and then, she runs out of energy, usually because of the kids. No, she's normal. Oh, she's, she's, no, she's, she's south of normal now. <laughs> yeah. Kids bring us all down to normal. Yeah. So, so um, you know, Remy, what have you, I mean, from a, from a woman like that, I mean, there are lots of people who are listening who feel very powerful and strong. Mm -hmm. And then we have people, I'm sure, that are listening who are not. Mm -hmm. We have people who are listening who don't have a strong husband, or a strong support system, I'm sure. I mean, I actually have a, a very strong support system. My husband would be doing just what you are doing. Mm -hmm. Well, if in what would you say to the immediate world that's listening? I know I asked you. There's a lot of there's a lot of questions I asked you all in that one little lump slum. But the first yeah. thing that comes to your mind in shedding light about breaking free or about living with a woman who's been through all this, what would you say? Um. Well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, when I met Sia, I didn't think of her as weak or frail or battered or anything like that. Um, she's very much who she is. And um, I think the first time I met her, she was shaking, which was quite funny. <laughs> but that's because Literally. we were both very nervous to meet each other. Um, but, um, I mean, it's she's so much her own person. And I think... Um, and that's the thing that I found about her all the way through is she knows so much about who she is and, and that's, this, that's where her strength comes from. Um, part of her difficulty with her childhood has been resolving who she is with what her childhood was and what, who her family was. Um, I do think the writing process, I think this whole journey she's been on with that has really helped her. Um, I mean, just putting it down, whether it be a diary or notes or something like that, allows it to become something which is more objective that you can point to rather than something that you're in the middle of, especially about a family and stuff like that is so raw and emotional. Once she got it down there, then, I mean, even when she handed me her first ma the manuscript that she handed me, it wasn't her first one, but it was an iteration. And But she sort of handed it to me and she said, this is me and I want you to read this before you know we go too much further. And it was great that it was like so, so much insight into her, but it was insight into her background and it gave me an idea of why she would react in certain ways to certain things and how tough it had been. But really it wasn't her, her was in front of me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was for me, I mean, yeah, that was pretty emotional to, to read it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, see, uh, when you, there's so, I mean, there's so many questions to ask. I mean, I've been wanting, there's so many I've been wanting to ask you all through the show, but I really think who you are, not just, well, where's your father now, but who you are, you know, as a human being and shedding <clears throat> light on this planet, you know, for people who are struggled with so many things or just need a little bit more push. You've, you, you've mentioned some things, but... Was it writing that was so important to you? Writing was incredibly important to me. I, telling my story was incredibly important to me. And though I started it off as my own way of trying to understand my family and work through the issues that I had with them, it ultimately became a journey to really try to help other people who 
you know, felt like outsiders because most mm -hmm. people look at me and they're like, how could she have ever felt like an outsider? You know, she's, she's got a great life. And, uh, but I did, I felt uh, painfully, horribly like an outsider. And so I really, it's become a project for me of like, listen, you know, you're not alone. People who feel like they will never fit in with their family, with society, with, mm -hmm. you know, they, they can, they can have that acceptance, but it comes from accepting yourself first. And, um, so that's just, that's my, my mission and my journey right now to, um, to let people know that they, they can do it. They can do whatever they want. They've just got to stick with, stick to their dreams and, um, you know, just don't give up. <laughs> and surround yourself with people who are supportive. And absolutely. Love yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I could never, ever have gotten that book out into the world without Remy. He, you know, he was so supportive. He never once said to me, um, do you think maybe this is kind of like not going to happen and you should just like give it up? He was always like, no, keep writing, keep writing. He'd take the kids on the weekends so I could write. He believed in me. He's been so supportive. Um, and he's been the, a really like, you know, kind of normal rock in my life that, um, that I so badly needed. And, um, we balance out, we balance each other out really well. So I just, I, I'm so fortunate, you know, to have him. So, you know, and I was, I think I mentioned this during the, the beginning of the show, but I don't remember. This is the first time I have posted a book with, from an author that we were having on the show that somebody actually had already read it that was part of my circle on Facebook. That has oh, never, right. ever happened. Never. So that just tells you, everybody out there, that this is a book that you are going to want to read, should read, go, you know, share you know, give it as a gift because, yes. you know, it's important. So why don't you tell everybody, you know, where to find the book and all that kind of stuff, your website, all of that. Here's the book. Sure. Well, um, in the States, uh, <laughs> there's the book. Um, I believe it's available at any bookseller, Barnes and Noble. Um, it's available on Amazon, uh, pretty much anywhere you can buy a book. Um, my website is seaperson.com. That's C-E-A-P-E-R-S-O-N.com. Tons of information there about, um, about my book, about where to buy books, all sorts of interviews that I've done. Um, book also club book club. If you're, if you're reading my book for my, for a book club, you can go on there and get discussion questions. Um, and, uh, my second book is a follow-up to, North of Normal. Um, the working title right now is Nearly Normal, and uh, it will fill in a lot of gaps, answer a lot of questions um, that you may, that any reader may have from the first uh, book, and that will be released by HarperCollins in um, spring of 2017. Perfect. So in closing, Remy, words of wisdom? Uh Words of wisdom for me on, on Sia, I mean... Well, on anything, Sia, this life you have together, you know, anything, um, you've, I, uh, anything I, you've observed. My word of wisdom is, is wait for the person that's right for you, because I did, and she showed up. And, uh, yeah, because I, I have to say also, like, you know, the trend, I listened to the, uh, her other friends talking about it. And I don't, I don't know, I, I always felt like an outsider, too, growing up. So, and I think that's how C and I also bonded because neither, not, uh, neither of us had any sort of uh, entitlement. Like we, neither of us felt like we were entitled to anything really. That's very true. That's but we true. also had a certain, we also knew what we were looking for. So it doesn't mean you're going to get what you're looking for just because you're looking for it, but don't feel entitled to it. So as much as you can uh it, it's, it's a balance like if you get too cocky you get knocked down if you feel too weak hopefully someone's there to prop you up and you do the right things to make yourself feel stronger mm -hmm. but it's life's a balance that way and uh with with sia it's been great because we found that balance and and it's you don't find that with everybody right you but know you it, find that with you do find that with important friends yes. and uh hopefully with the person you're meant to be with for the rest of your life yes. as well you know every when i go to do something you know, that's, that I feel is a stretch in some way, shape or form for myself. And I'll always look at my husband and I'll say so words of wisdom and he'll just, he'll give it to me. 
I mean, <laughs> he'll give me a word, he'll give me a line, he'll give me something. And what Remy just said was very important. When you when you when you be victim, that's when you're that's when you might as well call call it a day. Absolutely, yeah. so yeah. true. And that's something we really have strongly in common. We can't stand victims. And we, it's just, we don't believe in, you know, nobody's a victim. No. You pick yourself up and you do what you got to do. You exactly. Know? If you, yeah. Sia, if you had, you know, taken on the identity of victim, you never would have gotten where you are. No, of course never. not. And nobody no. ever will until no. they release that, that mindset. Absolutely. So when you talk about breaking free, you talk about freedom from that victim conversation because in yes. victim, you're always going to feel entitled. Absolutely. Yeah. And taking control and just, yeah. Yep. Don't be a victim, people. Don't be a victim. <laughs> Don't be. Sure. And so we're going to have to have Sia back here when she's close to releasing her next book, or maybe even before then, if she's Certainly. willing. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'd love to, Marilyn. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, we'd love to have you back. And uh, because I know that there's so many more things to just talk about with this. There's so many deep, you know, so many things you want to talk about with this woman. So, uh, I love I love talking. So <laughs> good, because go hours. <laughs> good, because I love talking and listening. <laughs> so I want to thank the both of you for you. being here today and helping to set this up and just being the people that you are for the you know for other people to see. So thank Our you very pleasure. much. Thanks. Yes, and see, you. I just um, you still got so much to share. So I really appreciate your what you've shared already and the honesty, because that's, you know, people, it's, it's such an, it's, it's surreal. So it's important, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It is a little surreal. It is. I wouldn't argue with you. No. So I want to thank everybody out there that's been listening. I want to thank all of the caller inners. It's been great to have you all here. You've uh, definitely taught me a, a whole lot. So I thank you for that so much. Come, thank you. you know, be back here next week for another great story. See ya. A word, two words in closing. Anything? Ah, go for your dreams. That's yeah. so corny, but, you know. <laughs> go for your dreams. That's it. So thank you all. We'll see you all very soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brock, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Parent Dome with Ryan Miller, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.